Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. God, we thank you for this afternoon. We thank you for your Word. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your love and mercy, God. We submit to your Word this afternoon, God, that you give understanding to the simple God. If indeed what we've heard is to hear you, God, cause us to hear you. Just cause us to hear you. Just cause us to hear you. Cause us to hear you, God. Second Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to begin from the 19th verse. If you're there, you say amen. Second Corinthians chapter 1. If you get to the 19th verse, you say amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. One, two, three, let's go. Uh huh. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was there. Read it again. For the Son of God, uh huh. Mm. Uh huh. Even by me, Silvanus and Timotheus was not yea and nay, uh-huh, but in him was nay. Next verse. For all the promises of God in him are yea and in him, amen, and to the glory of God by us. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Now I want us to read again from 19 to 20, only looking for the words in him. Uh -huh. For the Son of God, uh -huh, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. That's one. Next verse. For all the promises of God in him, number two, are yea, and in him, amen, and to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. Now, simply put, before I even start sharing, simply put, the question is where you are. You get it? You can have an outward religious affair, something that can put up a show to to say that you are Christian or that you're born again or that you love God or that he loves you. By the way, I know God. You know, like there are those people who, who, who want to show that they know. Eh? And he's my friend. Even yesterday we were together. You think I don't. Even I know him. Even I know his mother. Even I know even the food he ate. I even know his shoe size. I know. You get it? But we're not talking of the place of a man knowing God without God. We're talking of a place of a man knowing God because he is in God. So, there are nays and yes when you are outside. But when you're in the man, all promises. The Bible says all promises in him are yeah and amen. If, I'm talking of places where men have lived so outside Christ that they don't still understand the reality of the things spoken by the word. I want to talk to you about the immutability of God's counsel. The, the place where his mind can't change about what he has spoken. Sometimes there are those things we look into and then we claim the promises of God. God, I'm, I'm claiming this, I'm claiming that. You say it and I claim it, I take it in my heart, I receive it in my spirit. It is mine, it is mine. You get a hold of it. You draw all the gymnastics of getting a hold of something. But then it doesn't come to pass. 
I have learned over there that if I am standing on a promise that must be fulfilled, if it doesn't happen, my ultimate question is, where am I? You see, when God was dealing with Peter, you remember? If he says, if you are Lord, bid me to come, the Lord Jesus tells him, come. And then Peter starts to walk on water. Okay? And the Bible says, looking at the wind, he what? He feared and began to sink. When the Lord Jesus was dealing with him, the question he asked him, Peter, from whence did thou do what? And he said, and when Peter was come down out of the ship, uh -huh, he walked on the water. Matthew, huh? 14, 29, 30. Down out of the ship. And the Bible says he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. Next verse. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Where? At what place? Did you start doubting? Because if you were in my place, if, oh, oh, if you were in me, you could not have doubted. Where did you go? It was a place issue. It, was, it had nothing to do with the water. It even had nothing to do with the winds. But there was something that caused his eyes to look at the wind. But you see, even looking at the wind is not what caused him to sink. No, it's the place he went to. You get it? It's the place he went to. It's a place issue. Tell anybody it's a place issue. Tell him again. It's a place issue. It's nothing else. But that says when he saw, let, let's go back a bit. I want to show you something there. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. That was a place. He went to a place called afraid. He entered the realm of fear. He could have seen the wind and maintained his place in Christ. It doesn't matter what you see. If you leave your place, you will sink. And it doesn't matter what you experience. If you have not left the in Christ, you cannot sink. Because the issue is not the things outside. Though the issues that appear to you are outside, the solution is somewhere in you. It cannot be out. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? So there is a man to whom I'm speaking promise, but he looks at the outward experience of promise. He doesn't understand the inward experience of what it means to stand in the promise of God. The immutability of his counsel, I repeat. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? You see, sometimes when we believe God for certain things, and these things don't take effect as they should, many a time, many a time, we indirectly but deliberately question the ability of God and what he promised. Do you understand where I'm coming from? It might not be direct, it will be an indirect experience, but you will be questioning the ability of God to perform. You might not know how or why. In one way, in the back end, you're going to be questioning God. Can you really do this? Are you hearing me? I'm not going to get to that. Now, I thank God that Paul said this. He said, there's a Jesus other men preach. But if you're talking of the Jesus, I, Silvanus and Timotheus preached. I don't know about the other ones. They told you where you were growing up. But if you're talking of the Jesus that I, Silvanus or Timotheus preached, in that guy there was no no. In that guy. You can have your own version of Jesus and preach him whichever way you want because there are many things that we can narrate to the minds of men and consequently add up to become tradition and things that men grow to believe are true. You know, I've had all this nonsense in school. People say, ah, you see, there are three answers when you pray. <laughs> Amen. There are three answers when you pray. The first answer can be yes. The second answer can be no. Then the third answer can be, wait. So, there are many Christians who have not accepted no. They are waiting. They are growing old waiting. They are growing gray hair waiting. Everything is just waiting. You look at them and you see they have waited. But in Dirinani, Mukama. And then somebody becomes 40. Eh? I'm 40. You know, it's funny when somebody says, hey, 
I'm 40. What did you expect? <laughs> you are 40. Yes, you're 36. It's true. Yes. But you see, when you were young, 20, that, my God, you had this. Eh? You, I, you know, it's like when we were young. Eh? You remember? When you're growing up. Eh? When I grow up, I want to. Well, you see, childlike faith. Many people have never understood the mystery of childlike faith. Eh? But once you go back again to that mind, you'd be surprised why we're losing out on many things. Because you see, when you're a child, you're like, you're living in the realm of Isaiah. Come without money and buy. I mean, a cup of young, you know, it's you. <laughs> and nobody can take it away. They can even fight in like HOT. And then even fights ensue. Why? Because the kid claimed it is his. And they cannot go to school and think it's not theirs. And they're not lying either. That faith that can put a man up in a plane and a kid thinks he can wave. You see, some of you should. <laughs> Even this one sits here and saying, bye and says, okay, it's possible with this one, it's also possible with me. <laughs> One time when I was a, when I was a kid like this, I, no, I was grown, I think I should have been about 12. So there's this relative who brought a kid by to visit. You know those village people who come with their kids and stuff. So this very little kid, she was about five years. And I've never forgotten this, it has never left my head. Eh? So a plane passed. And then she looked at it, and then she spoke in the younger language. She said, that's the mama one, eh? the mama. On that day, mom, she's telling the plane, bring my mom. The mom had left her, she left her at home and went to town. So she was telling her, bring back my mom, okay, you bring her. Now you say, ah, kid is foolish. No, really, it's not. It's not. When you become a believer, you realize it's also possible. <laughs> Who understands what I'm saying? When you become a what? A believer. You know, when we were young, eh, we used to get leaves. You remember? You get leaves, put them here. Then you get a rubber band, you rub like a oh, bomb. <laughs> and then you start to feel like a rich. And, oh my God. Oh, oh my God. Now I look back and I have money and I say, hey, my faith began long ago. But you see, look at this face. He's just picking leaves. And that's how you're supposed to receive from God, but you, you refuse. Somebody listened to me on radio the other day and then sent a message to a friend. And he told a friend, I have only one problem with Apostle Grace. A friend asked him, what? The guy said, he preaches an effortless gospel. I don't believe in it. So the friend calls me and says, eh? Man, man of God, I really need to understand this because I'm told that you preach an effortless gospel. And um, they quoted one of the pastors here having spoken about the blood of Jesus, having whatever, that the cross and that, that, that. So the guy had that trouble. Because you see, all Christians, many of these guys, their issue is effort. Eh? You get it? They've never allowed God to work in them. So when, when they don't allow God to work in them, they think also... We don't believe in effort. We believe in effort, but the effort of God. Not our effort. You get the difference? So, but they also don't think God has effort. They think they are mandated to have effort. You get what I'm trying to tell you? So, the guy asked me, why are you preaching an effortless gospel? And I asked him also, where did you want the effort? Did you want to also go down and die again for the sins of the world? What? You want crucifixion also? You know, some Christians don't understand what Jesus did. Listen, there's a reason why God doesn't need you back on that cross. He went. He went. And he finished. For if you feel you want to die for the whole world, go back on the cross and take your sin. No, but the Bible says, let every man carry his own cross. Do you understand the concept of what he means to carry the cross? If you're going to carry it like the one of Christ, then we expect it's taking you on the Mount Golgotha somewhere where you must be crucified. So you want to become sin? That's so antichrist. You want to carry all our transgressions and be bruised for iniquities, but the chastisement of my peace be upon you who has no peace. 
Who understands what I'm saying? Tell your neighbor, tell him to feed it. Tell him. Holy Amala. Hallelujah. And you see, do you know that out of those kinds of thoughts, eh, the spirit of religion has created certain misunderstandings and misapprehensions of the things of God, even the way we pray. You see, you know Christians these days? You find a guy praying like this. I sprinkle the blood upon my house. I pray hey, people. I don't know what they think. You, you even put blood around your shoes, smile the blood of Jesus on your watch. Seriously. So are you saying that it's not necessary to sprinkle? And I ask you the same question. Why are you sprinkling on yourself what is already inside you? The Bible says we are of his body and his bones. We are of his flesh. You are the body of Christ. The body embodies blood. But you're sprinkling it on top. For he says you really have to for you. Wash the outside of the cup and leave the inside dead. The guy has not accepted Jesus. He hasn't understood the finished work of Christ on the cross and the price that he paid and the entity called salvation. But he's working on the outside. Live inside. Learn to live inside. Listen, when the Bible says that he maintainest your Lord, that should have been enough for you to understand. There is nothing outside you that is not covered. Look at Job. God has Job. Have you all considered this guy, my servant Job? Listen to what the devil says. Haven't you put a hedge around him and everything that he has? Do you know what that means? This is Job, a living soul. This is a living soul. You get it? He had put a hedge not only around Job, but everything that Job has. That means when Job buys something, automatically the hedge goes on. Simply because he bought it. You get it? When you get to that level, you stop sprinkling what's inside. It is finished. He shed that blood for the remission of your sins and the forbearance. Now your new creature, which is a fruit of the man which was died for. And this incorruptible man needeth not the shedding of blood to remit sin because he's incorruptible. He's incorruptible. Because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. But what is the sin to the new creature? Which is incorruptible? You are trying to prove that the incorruptible can be corrupted. But if we explain it, you're going to ask me the question, does that mean the new creature doesn't sin? Okay, it does to you. Me, it doesn't. Because that which is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him. He cannot. Because the divine sperm is inside the man's system. Listen, understand the new creature. This guy, your spirit man, cannot. Read it. No one, born or begotten of God, uh-huh, deliberately, uh-huh, knowingly, uh-huh, habitually practices sin, uh-huh, for God's nature abides in him, uh-huh, his principle of life, the divine sperm remains permanently within him, and he cannot practice sinning because he's begotten of God. The weakness of your flesh is different from the stability of your spirit. Learn to live from inside. Learn to live. That's why the Bible says if you live by the flesh, the weakness of your flesh, you will die. But if you buy the spirit, kill the transactions of the body, you will live. Live from inside. You have results outside. Begin from the incorruptible. You understand? You will turn every corruptible incorruptible. But you begin from the corruptible and seek to be corrupted, it means you trample down on the Son of God and you say that what he did did not earn you. In fact, that's why I love the way Paul said it. Paul did not call it earthly salvation. He called it eternal salvation. You're born again eternally. Your testimony of salvation is older than the way you live in the body and any consequence on the earth. Does that mean that I can do anything? Because you are impure. The Bible says to the pure, all things are pure. But 
to the disciples. You know those people. You know why they always say, oh, this apostle Grace, they preach a false thing. Someone is saying, oh, we have heard you're preaching this gospel. Da, 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 da. Because you see, let me tell you the truth. Many people at the place of getting born again, the incorruptible seed is not what entered them. They accepted Christ on a corruptible seed basis. So everything you say has a line and thought of corruption to it. When you say, I'm under no condemnation, they say, ah, that means you can do anything. Is that what you're saying? But really, do you realize it comes out of them automatically to assume? Hey, but you see, when a man's mind is full of the devil, even if you say, let's pray, that brain can wire a certain sort of prayer. You get it? He says, unto the pure. Uh -huh. All things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving. You see, the unbelievers is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. Give me the message version. Uh-huh. Everything is clean to the clean-minded. Nothing is clean to dirty-minded unbelievers. They leave their dirty fingerprints on every thought and act every thing. What have you said? Have you ever been around people? Even when you say, I'm going, where are you going? Eh, going, going. What do you mean by going, going? What do you mean say you? What do I mean by going, going? We're dealing with incorruptible people. We're not dealing with corruptible people. Our minds are not dirty. Everything we think is clean. When I say God cannot impute sin on me, I'm not under the law, but I'm under grace. I'm not thinking that that means I'm going to open my deep city. I'm not corruptible. I am incorruptible. I am incorruptible. I'm thinking from an incorruptible perspective. So when you start, eh, does that mean you are, do you know you are suggesting what any unbeliever should do? And you're putting it on me as a believer. And I don't agree. So, should I, like I love the way Paul thinks. Paul says, why am I put to bondage by another man's conscience? You know some Christians, eh? you have even failed to live a good life. Because you fear what people think on what you know is true. That's why many of you don't have peace. Oh, I fear to entertain. My father will think I'm coming from men. Are you coming from men? No, come in at 10 when you're from praying in tongues. If he thinks all right, that is impure thought. It's not your thought. Find it in your spirit. Comfort it. No, no. That my conscience, I cannot die, but of the other. For why is my liberty just another man's conscience? Why is it that because you think I'm going to do it, therefore I should do things not to make you think that I'm going to do it, so that you should be satisfied that I did things that make you think that I'm not going to do it, and at the end of the day I lose my liberty to do because I must. Who understands what I'm saying? Listen. If you know you didn't steal, it doesn't matter whether you look like a thief and you smell it. That's their problem. It's not mine. Do you understand what I'm saying? It doesn't matter if they show you with Rita. If the truth is that you have not told Rita nothing, find peace. Oh, no, no, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. Who are you? Are you going to explain to everybody until you think you'll ever satisfy men's consciences? Most so unbelievers. Do you think people will ever think you're innocent? They will never. You're wasting your time and my time, which I'm preaching now to explain to you, when I'm supposed to be preaching on the promise. People will never understand you. Be delivered from people. I have a sermon on that. You can look for it. They will find fruit. They will find fruit. So, when you're dealing with an impure thought, first of all, understand the man's place of salvation was not your place of salvation. His place of salvation was of corruptible seed. And you're trying to explain an incorruptible experience. How long? Except if he turns incorruptible, he will never understand you. He cannot receive, neither design the things of the spirit, for they are spiritually designed. You're trying to explain to him on a solid realm level. He will never. That means certain people will never understand you. Chikirize. Huh? 
But you see, your joy should be that those who understand you are more. They're more. And there'll always be more. Look at how many men misunderstood Jesus. But the guy still survived. Eh? They killed him, he's still raised. Who can say to take? To very cool. Do you understand what I'm saying? But to very cool. You, you, the Christian is unpredictable. And you must settle it in your heart that men will never interpret you as they want to. Let it suffice to us that we know the truth. Like, that's enough for us. You get it? They don't feed you. They don't close you. They don't visit you in hospital. Nothing. Let, let it be enough for you that you, you know the truth. And let everyone do what they, they have to do. You understand what I'm saying? Me, I was delivered. And I preach it like it comes. Uh -uh. Me, we used to sit with incorruptible men until the Lord told me, men, these men are corruptible. Even if they say we have understood you, they'll still go back and say we didn't. Because it's in their nature. It's beyond their thinking faculties. You get it? If my mind is pure, it is pure. Hallelujah. Anyway, back to the promised thing. I needed to probably make a point. So I was saying that unless you're talking of that other Jesus that you found anywhere in any other church or any other place, but if you're talking of the one Paul is preaching, Silvanus and Timotheus, Banange, in that fellow there was no no. And that was the beginning of me understanding the difference between the Christ that men preached and the Christ Paul, Silvanus, and Timotheus preached. Now I understood why the man says, on no other foundation should this gospel be preached, said on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Christ. Before you take it how you build, it's important we build on the true foundation. And this is the foundation. In this fellow there is no no. Just be out. That's your problem. But if you're in, there is no no. So for me now, I start to realize that the ultimate thought for every Christian is am I in the guy? If you abide in me and my words abide in you. You understand what I'm saying? If I abide in you, or if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, and my rhema abides in you, whatever you ask, it shall be given. But you realize that at that particular point, he says, if you abide in me, Logos, if you abide in Logos, how do you abide in Logos? By accepting Jesus Christ as your personal and Savior. The word is nice. That is the issue of salvation. You become born again, and Jesus enters your system. And he says, and my rena, that's not Logos there, and my rena abide in you. You shall ask what ye, it's not even me now, what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. It's not even me. Because I'm sure you can't ask him purely. What's the gear? You can't press silly thought. By the time she's the one who came to your mind, she has to be the one. It's not you, right? But you have to get to that level. So, in how many people does Rema abide? Many people have an abiding of Logos. There's no stir up in their spirits every time to hit it out to a place of Rema. The now what? The place where the Logos in you can create, define, and create experiences, divine experiences at that particular moment in every part of your life. Some people, they just have the word in their head. Some of them have it in their heart. No, no, no. I'm not talking of that. I'm talking of the, word, the time where every time Logos is inside your system, that is the entirety of the word of God. That's a place where it dwells in faith. You see that the Bible says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That you're being rooted and grounded. It's a place where when it comes to Logos, it's a faith issue. You must believe Christ resides in you. But he was the word. He became flesh. We beheld his only glory. I truth and full of grace and truth. This is Jesus. He, when you say, I accept Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior, you're actually saying, I accept Logos in me. So Logos comes in your system. But when Logos is in you, he cannot work without Rema. And the beetle pit there between Logos and Rema is called the spirit of revelation. 
For the revealed things, the Bible says, belong unto you and your children. It's the promise. He has not only given me as Apostle Grace, but anybody who should serve me can me. So there are things that must work in you because you submit to me. Before you even pray. Because of my meditation. You get what I'm trying to tell you? Do you understand you? So there are things that have to start to happen because of the message you're submitting to. That's why I told people, you, and we're showing it to pastors that they are very sick. Do you realize that when you join, you stop becoming sick? Many of you. You had no more cycles of malaria. Oh, I'm sorry. I went away. But you see... We don't wake up every day and say, and cover you under the blood. No. No. But when these words start to come to you, even, man, I wish some of you saw when this church had begun. Oh, God. These boys, who are, I see them smart these days, and I say, man. But you see, some of these guys, a guy comes in, in sleepers, he has come to pray. You understand? He doesn't even care whether Rod has seen or not. That's how they work. But look at what the word has done to them. You look. Some girls even, they didn't even know how to come here. A girl enters, eh? you know that hair of yes, we are, my knee, eh? I didn't interrupt you. You understand the hair, she's, in, she's, in, she's putting on a funny bag, you know, her shoes are dusty. Make her I look at them and I say, yeah, it is working. It is working. We didn't tell them dress well, no. The white told them. And they're not forcing it, borrowing clothes. I always don't borrow clothes. Do you understand, trying to tell you? But there was a time. Some of you didn't even have faith for transport. Now you can believe God for transport. But some of you, you say, hey, 2014 color it came. I didn't have a job, but some of money came. How could it not come? Under this message, how can it not? It cannot not come. It's not possible. You understand? So, there's a place where Logos distributes the grace to get Rema. And that means that in that particular point, occasion serves you. Occasion serves you. You start to live under open heaven. You stop to open heaven by prayer. There's a difference. That's why I, mean, I can do a miracle anywhere, anytime. You find me and see. Streets or no, nothing. You find me and I'm just sitting. I just wash my hands and die. There's no process of, oh, I, I build myself. I put on the armor. <laughs> I know how it's put on. But in the realm of experience, you see, there's a place in God when you're working with the mind of God. Eh? There's a place in the mind of the Spirit that can cause a man to say one statement but have several implications. You get it? Several implications. And when this is a language that you don't just learn, this is a, this is a language you don't force. It's a language that starts to work in your system by reason of revelation and the experiences that you carry in God. There's a language that starts to form up in your soul, but when the devil is interpreting it or any circumstance and phenomena in the spirit realm, it interprets many words of the same thing. I'll give you an example. When the Pharisee comes to Jesus and Jesus has done a miracle, you get it? Jesus asks the question, which is easier? Is it to say that your sins are forgiven? Or to tell you to carry your bread and walk? When I say carry your bed, which is easier? So Jesus is saying, there are things which are harder and the things which are easier. And as you grow in the mind of the spirit, certain things, must be spoken easier to save time and teach others. That's why I told you of a boy of HIV. I just told HIV, hey, 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 you can't be near me. But it was translated to it like I'm telling it. It has a mind. And the HIV left the boy. Now someone can say, look at him. How can it? That's cult. For us, the Bible told us, you shall rebuke. Did he rebuke anything? <laughs> but you see, which is easier? To say that your sins are forgiven, or to say, arise and take up your bed. Now, Jesus can get on a man which is dying, and he tells him, arise and take up your bed. But he's actually telling him also, your sins are forgiven. But he doesn't need to say it. And him not saying it can go to an impure mind, and the impure mind thinks, eh, eh? 
the man sinned. He had just raised him up with sin. This is cult. You see? Now, can we reason on that level? Because I didn't say he's forgiven. Does that mean that in my mind I shouldn't speak by the reason of simplicity of the gospel to satisfy your silly conscience that there was no place of forgiveness of sin? So, how then do I explain myself to a man who is not thinking here? How do I go down and then we start this little child fight? You, you're the one, you said it, I didn't say it. Then we start spiritual warfare. Listen, how? How do we start fighting our fellow brethren? You realize the understanding is small. You understand what I'm telling you? And in these things now, when the mind of the spirit starts to shed in your soul, you realize that there are certain statements the Lord will say. And they'll have very various implications. Only because the mind of God is being revealed to you in dimensions that when he says, go. It's like when he tells Peter, come. He has actually told the water, don't sink him. But he didn't need to say, water, don't sink him. Put the weapon. Command spiritual seminarity. Flat grounds. Angelics. Tell them forth. He just tells him, arise and walk. And that's it. But the simplicity of the spirit realm interpreting that this judgment can only come after man is forgiven. I wasn't there, but I'm sure something was spoken. The Bible says, and Jesus groaned in the spirit, and he asked, why have you laid him? She went, and he told him, Father, I thank you, because you hear me. Maybe the groaning on Christ was, Ugh! But that uh, was translated as you anointed me to heal the sick and raise the dead. This super guy cannot stay under that spirit of death. Now, I rebuke you, you spirit of death, right now. And I'm coming right now. And I must raise him because I said he can't die because I said Lazarus' sickness cannot end in death. How can this sickness be? How can I be disproved? I am truth. And therefore, as I come, I must deal with it. Thank you, Father, because you've had me. Translated simply, Jesus groaned. Oh, where have you laid him? Now that oh was all the prayer. Now, when, <laughs> like one time a girl had a demon one day, and I went to the girl, I did like, <laughs> the demon left the girl, she screamed and fell down. I just did like, now, you, you see me clapping. You know what this means? He says that the communication of your faith, not your words, your faith, there's a way your faith learns to communicate. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, it's the point where sometimes you should feel pain on your body and just Blow it up, darling. Now, the spirit realm has understood what you're saying. You just want to save a few calories talking. Because you don't have time to explain. And he even says, and this I've even prayed. So that they, they will hear me. And, and glorify you. But if it wasn't them, Jesus would just have been like this. Gets to the grave. And Lazarus comes out and they both walk back together. But he communicates. When you're in that realm... <laughs> things become simple you start to execute simple you start to speak simple a girl called me and she told me oh my marks I failed I just told her it is well 43 turned to 7 to something just the next day computer to the mark switched but when I said it is well every demon in hell and every fiber of the devil understood I meant to say those marks must change they just have to change. There is no shortcut, no long cut, there is no cut. <laughs> it has to be executed. Learn to live in that life. Just learn to. You realize that you simply say simple things. My dear, don't worry, and you've sorted it. You don't need to, to study. In the name of Jesus now. Every demon, every scientific demon, every metamorphotic demon, every mathematical demon, Every 
biological demon, every demon now, we seek you. I say we seek you. I say we seek you. I say we seek you. By fire, by fire, by fire, by fire. <laughs> they even give demons that don't exist. You red color demon. <laughs> red color demon. You even grow older, your face starts to shrink and, and have wrinkles, you, your voice starts to die. <laughs> For you take Apostle Grace just goes on his bed and God starts speaking. For you go, God speak, speak God. You get up. Yes, sir. Until your voice dies. He just gets in the atmosphere and says, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. And he tells me, shut up. I want to talk. Aya! For me, he's desperate. For you, you're desperate. You get it? Tell your neighbor, live inside. Live in him. Don't move. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Let's begin from verse 1, verse 4. Tell your neighbor, it's working. He says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, uh -huh, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us uh -huh, through the righteousness of God. So you realize if a man is not in the righteousness of God and has no righteousness, cannot move? Do you realize why people in the law are struggling? Because the place that approves us is the precious faith through the righteousness of God. The faith of God can operate fully when a man understands the righteousness. Look at a man who is believing God for healing and they're not getting healed. That man has not yet understood the gift of righteousness. When he does, disease will leave. Do you understand what I mean? Disease will leave. Because it's the rightness of God. Which disqualifies any place for you to be wrong. So when you say, I am healed, eternity and everything else proves you true and manifestation takes course so you see that precious faith can only come through the righteousness which is of god not the righteousness of men and now the bible says that now the righteousness of god without the law has now been manifest or revealed and testified by the prophets even the righteousness of god through faith oh let's read it verse 20 Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified inside. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. 21, sorry. But now, listen, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Next verse. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus. So you see that? When the righteousness of God comes and you receive it, you stop moving by your faith. Oh, ho, 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 ho. You stop moving by your faith. You start moving by the faith of Jesus. So, we disqualify the you believing, we qualify the Christ in you believing. How can the lame man not walk? If it is not your faith. You see, it's not working because you are the one believing. The faith of God can take effect when the man has understood the righteousness of God and received it. So precious faith. Precious faith. Precious faith comes entirely by the righteousness which is of God. So if a man seeks justification by works, that man can never move in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Uh -huh, let's continue. He said... They have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus. Let's continue. Grace and peace, listen, be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Uh -huh. According as his divine power uh -huh, has given unto us all things uh -huh, that pertain to life and godliness uh-huh through what how how does it work how does it work through knowledge how 
how do these things that God has promised you work? So if a Christian comes to me and tells me, Apostle Grace, I've done everything and things are not working. What are they not doing? What are they not doing? What are they not doing? They're not seeking knowledge. They want quick fixes. My family. My cousin's sister. Even my uncle. You let me bring everyone. Cousin. You know? But you see, why are you doing that when the Bible has shown how you should do it? You're living on my faith. It's not fair. So if I go for lunch, your faith goes for lunch. If I go on the beach, your faith goes on the beach. If I sleep, your faith sleeps for 12 hours. You're living on another man's faith. How long? Tell him get your own. Let's continue. According as this divine power has what? Given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Uh -huh. Whereby, after the past and the man has said to know, are given unto us exceeding and great precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So, do you see the place of promise? The place of promise is bigger than I'm promising you. The place of promise comes after the man has gotten the knowledge of God in truth. And that knowledge starts to reveal to you the promises. And by these promises are ye made a partaker of the divine nature. That means you start to prove a certain nature in your system that is more than human. You start to live superhuman. You start to live like God. You start to demonstrate a godly kind of nature, but by these promises. So you don't take the promises for granted. You don't take the promises for granted. That's why it says in, in uh, I think Joshua 21, I think around 45 there. He said, he promised the children of Israel. Um, mm -hmm. He promised the children of Israel, and Yaz Pastor and Joshua is finishing this chapter. He says, and there fail, listen, not out of any good thing which the Lord had spoken unto the house of Israel, all came to pass. It goes back to, has he spoken? Unless you're talking of another God outside, Timotheus, Silvanus, and the one Paul spoke. But if you're talking of that Jesus, which Paul, Timotheus, and Silvanus spoke, everything he spoke about your life will come to pass. Just stay in him. Just stay in him. The only way it will not is if you stay out and start to live out instead of living in. That's why the ultimate responsibility of the church is to preach the in Christ truths, not the outward experiences. And today you're dealing with ministers who don't even know the difference. They don't know truths that are in Christ. They don't know truths that are in Christ. They are in the truth that are outside Christ. And Christians, for so long, have lived outside Christ. You know, there I heard a man speaking. You know you can be there, and problems come. And problems will come. It's true, they'll come, I don't mind that. But you're not going to get your way in everything. Then they give examples of the Bible. That's error. That's error. If I'm in Christ, I'll get my way on everything. Things are not always going to work out. They will, no, listen, if I'm in Christ and trouble comes, it will work for my good. So trouble stops becoming trouble for me because I'm in Christ. I can then count it all by joy because I'm not living outside, I'm living in. You get where I'm coming from? So that definition of trouble is like them without a God in this world. Alienated from the life, like Paul talks about the Gentiles. But our life in God cannot define trouble the way they define it. And then a man gives a personal example. I was run time rich. And I lost everything. One time I went to a meeting where they were testifying how they lost everything. And they were invited in that conference to explain how they are living below bare minimum because they lost everything. And my spirit is simple. They didn't give fast fruit. They didn't tithe. And now they are teaching you how... Do you understand what I'm saying? You didn't give your fast fruit. You're not tithing. 
you've lost everything and they're calling you in a conference to explain to people how you've lived without. And you're quoting Paul, for I know how to live. <laughs> you're quoting Paul, but I know how to live to be full and I know how to abound in much and how to be empty from both instructed, both to be full and the best. I'm instructed. Listen, if you are instructed, why are you still poor? Get rich like tomorrow. Because you know how. Like Paul said, I know how to be. It's a not knowing how. So the superstar didn't do his principles. They lost everything. They're living below bare minimum. And they're being called in a conference to explain to people how to stand in times of trial. Which trial they put themselves in by not doing the principles. That is uttermost foolishness. And those are the people sitting on conference ground, spending our time and money, seated. Then then people even get notes. Then they decide to give us those steps of financial management. Listen, let me tell you, I'm becoming a bit more arrogant when I understand how God works. If you're poor, you have no teaching of financial management, you can teach Grace Vega. Maybe other people, but not here. Let me tell you, atambuza bali manze ya njigiri zanti weba tuwa tambula. Neho wato naba tambuza brother. Eh? Jangu tu somefe na. You have to be humble. You, you, you have to be humble and say siti sobola. Let me learn. Are you hearing me? If you don't know how to make money, go to a man who knows how to make money. Let him teach you. Learn to make money and teach others. But for you poor, you're again proud. You're teaching financial management. Financial management. And you know, this minister just spent their time teaching, don't overinvest, don't diversify. I said, no, come. There's something wrong. Because what should say is not even anywhere in the scriptures. There's that which scattereth, but tendeth to, to increase. But this person is telling people how Smaya live in your budget. Let me tell you, Christians. Let me tell you this as Apostle Grace Vega. Me, I bet my life on this. If you live in your budget, you're going to die a human being. If you learn to live outside your budget, you're going to die like a child of God. Look at this. Listen, I'm sorry, but me that's how I think. You're just learning more English and more CVs, but you're not growing richer. I promise. That day I saw a guy teaching people budgeting. I looked at him. He wasn't inspirational. He, nothing on him was inspirational. No, let me give you an example. Look at Jesus. He's moving with 5,000 men and he doesn't have money. That's the kind of God you believe. Timothy, Silvanus, and Paul preached. He, he's living with 5,000 people and he doesn't worry whether they will eat. He asks them, How, what do you have? Two fish and five loaves of bread. Later, I'm like, they're anointing. But it's anointing. Are you hearing me? And he gets the bread and puts them up and says, Father, I thank you. And they all had to eat. Live that anointing. Now, you, you live in budget. I think if that man met Jesus, <laughs> Jesus would be saying, now let us distribute these few pieces to these younger children. The children shall have pieces, and these two pieces each, after they all have pieces. Then the rest, you can learn it to dig with your own hand. If you work hard, because even in this generation, he does not, does not work, shall not what? Shall not eat. So, this is, oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> What would I Jesus? Thank you! Allah, thank you! Because you, you are the only one who understands. Eh. He told his disciples, One time I sent you with no purse, no money, no nothing. Did you lack anything? And when you read in the synagogues, you never heard that the disciples were saying, Give. Let me tell you, there is an anointing. There's a level in God that you can't reach in that anointing. And money doesn't lose appetite and sleep to look for you. There's a place. <laughs> There's an anointing. The moment you enter there like this, another battle starts of explaining your wealth. Another spiritual battle starts. They have found that recently we were in a meeting. People were, you know, Guys from government officials were questioning our money. He said, we are funded by what? They check our statements and they realize what? So it's important that people, and I pray people start investigating you. I pray in the name of Jesus that people start investigating your money. They start investigating your job, your shoes, your clothes, the plots of land you have. Not because, no, simply, simply, the guy you believe can fit 
5,000 men with two fish and five loaves of bread. I don't know how he does it. He only says that with God, all things are possible. It's a glory. It's an anointing. And it works. You live in budgets and refuse to give big. Because you're living in budgets. You refuse to give. For us, let us give and you see how we live. We we'll live so large. We we'll live so large. May I stop human budget? I can't wake up and say, today I'm going to eat 1,000. No. Sometimes I'm at a restaurant and I see Christian brothers and all I think is feeding them. The next thing I know, I feed them all. That's how I think. Because you can't tell me, I'm living below 40,000, so these Christian brothers can come. And then they just sit and not test the blessing. Look at God. Does God live under budget? You budget. Me, I'm not going to budget, I swear. Okay, you will not understand me now. You'll understand later. I'm not going to budget. I'll believe. And I'll have everything. Listen. He says you've been given everything that pertains to life and godliness. He didn't give you the limit to budget under. He just told you you've been given everything that pertains to life. That means everything you'll ever want in this life, you have it. But you're living in a budgeted life of a man who doesn't have. And he's trying to get. Anyway, you'll understand in future. You watch us and a few people here in the congregation. Like precious promises. So when he says Joshua, none of those things has not come to pass. He meant it. He meant it. Now, something happened, and I want to show you one thing before you close. Something happened, and you know, I was trying to understand the mind of God pertaining this. And I was driven to something. In, um, you remember Hebrews 6? Let's read there. I want us to read something there. You know, it's something I've read before, but I want to show you something that just blew me. 17. Let's begin with 17 because of time. Uh-huh. Let's read. Where, where in God, uh-huh, willing more abundantly uh-huh, to show unto the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by a oath. Let's read. Next verse. That by two immutable things, of which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the that is set before us. Let's continue. Mm -hmm. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, but sure and steadfast, and which enters into that within the veil. That hope is sure and steadfast. Give me the Amplified of that particular version. And see the hope you carry. Now, we have this hope, listen, as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, it cannot, and it cannot break down under whoever steps and upon it. A hope. Nobody can take away what you believe. Losing that job doesn't, mother, if I have to be, shut up, darling. Even if a man steps upon it, it can't move. It says that that reaches further and enters into the very certainty of the presence within the veil. Give the message version. You want to let go? It's an unbreakable spiritual lifeline, reaching past all appearances right to the very presence of God. It's unbreakable. Next verse. Let's continue the message. Uh huh. Where Jesus, running on ahead of us, has taken up his permanent post as a high priest for us in the order of citizens. So ask God, why did you go there? Why did Jesus go in advance for you? Give me the King James. The King James says, where well, Christ Jesus Christ has, our foreigner has entered, for us entered. Even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of citizens. That's what the foreigner is for us entered. Jesus went for us to enter. He went for us. He entered there for us. So the question was, why did Jesus enter there for us? Yet it's us who need to receive the promise. And then the Spirit blew me. Galatians 3.16. I want to explain something. Let's read. Galatians 3.16. I want to say something. Let's read. Uh -huh. Now, to Abraham and to his seed 
were the promises made. He says, not unto many seeds as of many, but as of one unto thy seed, which is Christ. You will understand. I need a volunteer to come and stand here. I want to show you something. Come. Now, I need another one to come here. I need two. Apostle Emma, stand here. Now, look at these two guys. This is the unborn again believer. He's not actually a believer. Unborn again. The unborn again unbeliever. That's what I meant to say. This is a believer. Now, Apostle Emma, okay, you come. Let me get for your place. This is Christ. You're happy now? You know when my nursery say they refused me to add my body. Okay, now you're happy. All right, now look. Christian. Unbeliever. Christ. So God is saying, I, I have a plan. I need to promise. But this one, because he's an unbeliever, he's a stranger. The Bible calls him a stranger to the promise. Have you read that personal scripture? That calls them strangers to the promise. You get it? So, because he's a stranger to the promise, even if I promise I'm wasting time, he'll never get me. He'll never understand me. This one is an acquaintance to the promise and a receiver of a promise. You get it? But this one, because he lives two worlds, he's a Christian, but he has this nature. He might doubt. Because he experiences trials and tribulations, he might doubt. Even as a Christian, he still has tenets of the stranger. So there is a life he lives as a stranger to the promise, even though he's the direct recipient of that promise. So I realized that if I promise directly him, there is a force in this nature that will always counter attack to create a strange attitude in his soul pertaining what I've spoken. So I realized that even though he's a Christian, he has a certain nature that is Adamic. And that Adamic nature can misapprehend. So, let me not promise him. Let me promise this guy. This guy is in my nature, Jesus. This guy is in my character, Jesus. This guy has been with me from eternity. This guy, he has been with me in the past. This guy is truth. This guy is righteousness. This guy is wisdom. This guy is glory. This guy is understanding. This guy is me. He's entirely me. He is the visible image of the invisible me. This guy. You get it? So, not unto Abraham and his seed. But it says now to Abraham and his seed, where well, the promise is made. He says, not unto seeds, as of many, but unto seed, the seed, thy seed, which is this thy. So he tells Jesus, I am going to make you this, I am going to make you that. Now Jesus is asking, I entire those things. And this man says, this Jehovah God says, you are these things. But if I don't pass it by here, this guy won't understand. Okay. Now, when it gets to the place where I must fulfill, I don't want a double-minded fellow to come in my presence. No. You, when you come, you will understand what I mean. That when I say I have made you rich, I will multiply you. You, in your mind, you know I am your God. I'm God. I'm Father. I'm your Father. I speak of the things that are not as though they were. You get what I'm trying to tell you? And I'm this God who speaks things which are already finished. You know me. So when I say, I will bless you, I actually mean I blessed you. You, you know. But he doesn't. Because the time frame in which you live is eternal. The time frame in which he lives has a future tense. And you don't exist in future present. 
you are time. So, you behold the end of these things. You are the beginning and the end. You are the author and the finisher. You are the alpha and you are the omega. You, you understand. So this is immutable. So, I am swearing by my name. Okay? But I realize you will never understand. Now, the moment the promise reaches to be fulfilled, because he doesn't even know how to pray, you come in advance for him. That when I am fulfilling, I am not fulfilling anymore based on his thought and his level of faith. I am fulfilling to fulfill the immutability of my counsel. If, if he has sinned, you, you haven't sinned. If he has stolen, you, you haven't stolen. If, if he has lost it, you, you have never lost it. You understand? You, you're perfect. So when I'm answering, I'm answering you. It's up to you to you sort your business. So, in Christ, <laughs> oh, things are yes and amen. Because, I've not fulfilled based on your prayer last evening. I've full, fulfilled entirely on this guy. So all the promises are in him. If you're talking of the Paul, the Timotheus, Silvanus, when they enter him, they understand. They cannot be named. Now, what do you need to do? Just enter the guy. You may be seated. So, God is not obliged to answer because you did anything. He's obligated upon the Christ. I don't know if you understand how impossible it is for you to die when he said you'll leave because this has nothing to do with Nixon or woman and his appetite. It has nothing to do with what he drank or didn't drink. It has nothing to do with what the doctor said or didn't say. It has entirely to do with the Christ he promised. So when the Christ goes in advance, he goes there entirely on one thing, for us. So he goes to say, God, I see him say, you promised them, but you had to pass it by me. Now I pray, it be delivered because that was your ultimate plan. Can God say no to Christ? Why do you lose peace? Why do you lose sleep and appetite? If Christ was not denied, everything you have asked for in Christ is there. Yeah. And amen. I am sure you're going to be everything Jehovah God promised. I don't care whether you feel it. I don't care whether you have the guts for it. I don't care whether it's big for you, it's too dark for you, it's too brown for you, it's too high. It, I don't care what whoever said. I don't care who said upon your life that you'll never be anything, you'll never be a success. You went into salvation. It doesn't matter what they say because God has set his stake entirely on the Christ. My simple instruction is trust. On the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. Period. Don't complicate salvation. Did He promise? Did He say that I shall make you the head and not the tail? You're beyond not being the head. Did He promise that I shall make you rich? Did He promise that I shall bless you? Did He promise that the blessing shall add no sorrow? Did He say that none of you shall be barren? Did he say that you shall inherit the kingdom? Did he say that you're going to shake this earth? Did he say that you shall be blessed in and blessed going in and blessed going out? Did he say that you're blessed in the city and the country? Did he say that you shall go to your grave full of age like a stock of wheat in its own season? Did he say that you're more than conquerors by him who strengthens you? Did he say you can do all things by him who strengthens you? Did he say that he can do exceedingly abundantly above that which you ask or think? according to the working power that worketh in you. Did he say that he shall maintain your lot? Did he say that the lines are fallen unto you in prison places and you have a goodly heritage? Did he say that he shall do you good all the days of your life? 
Did he say that the stars shall not scorch you? Did he say that 10,000 shall fall at one side and a thousand on the other, and none of those three shall remain in time? You did he tell you that you shall not fear the arrows that fly by night, neither the pestilences by day? Did he promise that he shall send angels charge over you? Did he say, oh, shit? If he did, let it suffice your spirit that he will fulfill it entirely as one who promised the Christ. Because he, the Christ is the only entity that cannot doubt. And that is why Paul says, I live, but yet I'm dead, yet not I, but Christ. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son. You're living now by the faith of Christ. This is Christ in you, reminding the Father that he promised the Christ. There's no way you cannot be a success. I don't care what you've lost. I don't care what is behind you. I don't care what will be ahead of you 20 years. I am so sure you will finish well. I am persuaded. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I decree and declare upon your life, you will not fail. You will never fail. Your success, no power of hell, no scheme of man will ever pluck you from his hand. Your success today, your success tomorrow, because Jesus commands your destiny. He was promised to, he was fulfilled to. And because you are in him, the Jesus, Timothy, the Jesus, Sylvanus, the Jesus, Paul, the Jesus, I, Christ, you make a preach. In him is all oh, yeah. And amen. There is no name. And God has granted everything you desire. In the name of Jesus. Give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at sonerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.sonero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.